Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leslie Markley. I'm the Instructional Media Project Manager here at the Language Learning Center, and I'm also a doc candidate at the University of Wyoming College of Education Instructional Technology Program. So I'm going to be talking today about the research I did with using virtual reality and with heritage language learners. So quick overview of what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to give you some background about heritage language learners, a definition of what we mean when we're talking about that. I'm going to talk about the role that VR can play in the language classroom, talk about an overview of the game that we designed, and then of course an overview of my research, study and design, and results. So, HLL background, who are heritage language learners? Um, for the purpose of this study, I use the definition that the UNM HLL program uses, um, which if you guys know Damian Wilson, it's his definition. So we're looking at students that have exposure or connection to the language through their community, through their family, or through their cultural heritage. We're not just excluding it to people that have a language other than English spoken in the home environment. And as you can imagine, this is not a small number. This data is from 2013, so we're already seven years out, so it's probably grown. But in 2013, we were looking at an estimated 60 million people that speak a language other than English at home. Um, so we're very fortunate that we have a heritage language program for Spanish here at UNM. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere. So. In those cases, the heritage learners wind up in traditional language classrooms. And what happens in those cases, um, I've got this quote from Stephen Crash that kind of sums it up really well, but the heritage learners can be in an unfortunate position because they're expected to do well. Because they grew up with this, they know this, they should do well. If they don't do well, then it's really damaging. And it can especially be bad because they don't respond to error correction the same way that traditional language learners do. It's because you're not just correcting, oh, you said that sentence wrong. It's an integral part of them that you're correcting. So that really can be hurtful for their learning processes. Um, expanding on the challenges, when I was doing my literature review, I ran into a lot of cases of feelings of inadequacy and disconnect um, where people were basically saying, I grew up hearing this every day in my community, in my home. Why can I not speak it? Um, the other thing that I saw a lot of in the literature was people missing cultural cues. So for example, the learner would grow up speaking their language around their little sister, the community, and then their grandparents would come to stay with them. And that kind of leads us to the missing cultural cues leads to poor outcomes because then their parents would say, how could you be so rude to your grandmother? Why would you talk to her that way? And they don't know because they've always been using their language with you know, someone younger. So they don't know to use the more respective forms. Um, finally, I think the most insidious and I think the one that has unfortunately been popping up more probably in the last few years is the devaluation of the heritage language and culture, which is definitely truly unfortunate. Um, the impact that these challenges can have, it starts off with the learner not practicing their heritage language, and this can move on to them not engaging with their heritage culture, because thinking even about the academic environment that we're in, you know, when we speak to each other, we're speaking in academic terms, we're talking about pedagogy and things like that. Language is very important for group inclusion, so if you're not speaking the language, then you start being excluded from that group. And once you get excluded from the group, then it just makes you want to speak even less. Why not practice with the community? Um, we're fortunate that we have a very large heritage language community for Spanish here in Albuquerque. Not so much with other languages, and obviously not everywhere does have this. I can't easily find someone to speak French to. Apologies to Marina. <laughs> um, but Access is a big issue for things like this. Um, and more than that, you know, we do have things like Talk Abroad and Skype. We could pair someone up, someone up with a native speaker. But we also have fear of criticism because these are their language peers. These are people that are on the same level as them. Nobody wants to look inadequate or not proficient in front of their peers. So this brings us to virtual reality. Um, virtual reality has been used successfully in language classes. Um, and not so much with the immersive VR like what we did, um, 
This was using massively online role-playing games and also Second Life, which is pretty much dead, but it was in quite a boom for a while there. Um, it's been shown to reduce anxiety in learners. It's great because it allows for repeated practice. Um, it brings in a lot of the same benefits that game-based learning does. There's less fear of failure. They can do it as many times as they want. The game isn't going to get sick of them and say, okay, we're done today. Um, and also authentic environments, which of course nothing is ever going to be as good as real life, but virtual reality, you can get pretty close. The theoretical framework um, is based on flow theory by this guy right here, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, it's Hungarian. <laughs> it's Hungarian, yes, and I, am, I will butcher it. Um, but flow theory is a state of learning that I think we all think of as being in the zone. So it's when you're hyper-focused on what you're doing, you lose track of time, you find what you're doing rewarding in and of itself. There's like that perfect balance of skill and challenge. So it's a really optimal state to achieve in learning. And if you achieve that state of flow, then it's really great for reducing anxiety in the learner. So overview of our VR game, which presumably why everybody's here. Um, so we created a VR game because when I was looking at the use of VR in language learning, there's lots of stuff about VR for second language learners. There was nothing about what heritage language learners thought of VR. So I wanted to find out if they thought there was any value to using virtual reality for practicing their language or their culture. Um, so it's focused on verbal language production. They play the game wearing an Oculus Rift VR headset and they talk to the virtual avatars in the game. Um, it's a mystery game, so it's very finite goals. You're there to solve the mystery, get you to point A from point A to point B. Um, so there's not a lot of opportunity for them to go off the track and try to talk to the avatars about something they're not programmed to respond about. Um, there's cultural cues and elements throughout the game. I'll expand on that in a minute. And it's also a scaffolded experience. So they start off with very basic things like, hello, how are you? Yes, no. Move on to things like talking in the past tense, giving commands, things like that. Uh, the cultural and contextual tie-ins, um, speaking to the characters in an appropriate manner is a big one. Uh, they are expected to have like an actual conversation, not just one-word answers. Uh, the main character that the players talk to is an older adult, so they're also expected to use the formal verb tenses. If they use an informal verb tense, then the helper character says, hey, maybe you should be a little more respectful, you know, kind of guide them into doing that. Um, it's also, also, they're expected to, like I said, stay on topic. The avatars respond with nonverbal communication, so they will smile or frown depending on the reaction. Um, and also there's other cultural elements and tie-ins. There's folklore, there's food, there's relig religious iconography, there's the layout of the house, there's a lot of stuff. So, characters in our game. Um, the game is localized in northern New Mexican Spanish. Uh, we had all the dialogue translated by a native of Truchas, which is where the game is set. Um, so it has a lot of the northern New Mexican Spanish dialect with the dropped consonants, the archaic forms, and English word inclusion. Um, and the player is visiting their aunt, Tia Harmon, who lives in Truchas. They're accompanied by their cousin, Juan, who is there as a helper character um, that not only will you know, help with things like, you know, hey, be more respectful with the environment, but also if the player gets really lost, they can ask Juan, what did she just say? And he'll respond with a simplified form of whatever the last dialogue spoken was. Um, because it's a mystery, we have to have our antagonists. So we have Amanda, who is Carmen's antagonistic neighbor and may or may not be a witch. And we have Roberto, who is Amanda's mysterious father. Um, as for how it works, that's a presentation in and of itself. Um, the answer is thousands of man hours. And woman hours. <laughs> hmm? Woman hours. Woman hours, okay. <laughs> thousands of woman hours, and the entire thing was done in Unity and coded in C-sharp. Um, just really briefly how it works, the player speaks, 
it's processed through the IBM Watson speech to text engine, and that returns a text string of what the player just said. That text string gets sent to the AI brain, which is run through a program called Spirit Character Engine, um, which is a really great little program for building simple AIs, and is free as of right now. Um, and the output from the AI comes back and goes into a plugin called RT Voice Pro, which then speaks it out loud. Um, we do also have four Ivana voices that are a little more authentic sounding, so it doesn't sound so much like you've just called and you've wound up talking to your bank's automated line or something. So, now demo. Um, and what you're going to see in this is unfortunately me talking to the characters, um, but we'll go ahead and play it and let you see what the first few minutes of the game look like. ¿Quieres que el juego haga tu nombre con pronombres masculinos o femeninos? Bueno, voy a usar pronombres femeninos contigo. Empieza el juego. Ahí está mi sobrino. Hola. Hola, tía Carmen. Hola, me da mucho gusto conocerte al fin. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿y tú? Valgame Dios, lo que has aprendido viviendo en la ciudad. Quizá deba hablarle a tía Carmen con más respeto. Recomiendo usar usted cuando habla con ella. Ser bueno pedir perdón, también. ¿Cómo está usted? He estado bien. Había estado esperando tu visita ansiosamente. No había estado tan ansiosa en mucho tiempo. ¿Quiere pasar por adentro? Sí, por favor. Juan, ¿por qué no llevas estas cosas al cuarto de los visitantes? Pues esta es mi casa. Espero que estés a gusto aquí. Estaré allí en un momento, mija. Bueno, ¿quieres un vaso de agua, hija? Sí, por favor. Aquí tienes. Sabes tú que esta casa tiene mucha historia. Los cuentos que te podría contar. Esta casa ha sido de nosotros por mucho tiempo, desde que fue Merced. Ha cambiado bastante a lo largo de los años. Me crié en esta casa. ¿Sabías tú que mi papá me dijo que había un tesoro escondido en la casa? No. Mi papá me dijo que había mucho dinero escondido en alguna parte de la casa. Ya sabes que la gente de antes escondía sus pertenencias en las padres de adobe. Si acaso había un tesoro, yo nunca lo encontré. A mí se me hace que solamente me contaba eso para que me durmiera. Ah, hola gatita. ¿Has venido a saludar a tu nueva amiga? Me pregunto cuántos años pudiera tener este gato. Ella nunca me ha dicho, por cierto, pero si tú le preguntas, quizás te lo diría a ti. ¿Cuántos años tiene su gato? He tenido a la linda por muchos años. Ya está viejita como yo. Es una buena gata. Es bonito tener con quien platicar. Y no seas tan formal, hija. Puedes tutearme. Alabado sea. ¿Quién pudiera ser? Ojalá y no sea quien pienso que es. Oh, hola Amanda. ¿Qué se te ofrece? Okay. So, so what all just happened is the player arrives, they greet the apartment, um, get asked into the house, get asked if they want a glass of water, you know, pretty basic stuff. Um, Dia Carmen says, hey, by the way, did I ever tell you there's a 
that my dad said there's a treasure in the house, and that's kind of what starts them on the whole mystery path. Also, the cat shows up and Juan says, you know, she won't tell me how old this cat is. So that's kind of where the New Mexico folklore or magical realism starts getting looped into it to um, kind of heavily inspired by Rodolfo and Aya because I really like him and <laughs> that just kind of happened. Um, so overview of the research. Um, the, like I said before, the main question I was looking at is, what do heritage language learners think of using VR? Um, this was kind of broken down into three sub-questions. To what extent were they able to rec recognize cultural elements in the VR environment? Um, what are their perceptions of using the VR environment? And how does it align with flow theory and reduction of anxiety? Um, it's a qualitative study. I had participants answer a demographic survey that had background information on their exposure to Spanish and kind of where they had lived previously. Um, I wrote down reflective um, observations while they were playing the game on the choices they made, interacting with the environment, and then they responded to interview questions afterward about their experience with the environment. Demographically, um, we had 14 participants, pretty even mix of male and female. Um, average age was 21.8, so about what you'd expect for a college population. Um, we had people from all over the state <coughs> responding, so that was great. We also had one from West Texas and one from South America, which brought in kind of a useful outside perspective. Um, as far as the exposure to Spanish, everybody said that they spoke Spanish either with their friends or their family. Um, and all but one participant said that they felt that they really understood the points of the conversation. So they had a pretty high confidence level going in. Some regional differences that came up going back and looking at the demographic information. Um, participants in southern New Mexico had more problems with getting the speech to text to understand them. Um, and one participant actually pinned it down and said, you know, my C's and Z's and S's all come out sounding the same, like S's at the end. So the one that really tripped up the people from the south was when they said C, the speech to text would read it as seen. And so then, you know, it would default to the, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you just said. You know. So that was a little frustrating. The other thing which we kind of didn't foresee was code switching um, because we were using the northern New Mexico dialect. We did have English words in there. And so the participants also tried to throw in English words, hmm. which was interesting to note. Um, it did cause some issues because you know when you call a phone line and it says, Bias on the local prima and the winner of it, that's because speech to text is not at a point yet where it can switch easily. So when they threw out English words, the AI just kind of went, eh, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but everybody did try to also kind of emulate what the AI was doing for them with the English words. Um, one other regional difference, which was kind of fantastic, um, Dia Carmen, during a tense moment in the dialogue, says, Va Dami Dios, which, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the first person to swear in my speaker series presentation. We had two people from Southern New Mexico that were super shocked because to them that meant, oh my fucking God. Oh. And they, they were like, why is this sweet old lady swearing like this? What just happened? Um, fortunately, both of them were very, very early in the process, so I wound up asking everybody else about that and saying, was this shocking to you? And everybody else said, oh no, that's more like, oh goodness gracious me. So, um, just something to consider. If you're localizing for a very specific population, you might have some unintended side effects. Um, cultural aspects identified, they were able to identify a lot of cultural aspects. Um, pretty much everybody spoke to Tia Carmen respectfully just off the bat. And when I asked them about, about that, they said, well, she's older, she's a nice old lady, of course I'm going to talk to her with instead. And they really humanized these AI characters, which was very interesting. Um, they spoke politely and used complete sentences for the most part. I had two uh, participants that clearly had some gaming background and they really wanted to speed run this, and so they were trying to respond with one word answers. And after a while, they kind of fell out of that and started actually talking to the AI like it was a person. So that was also interesting to observe. 
um, environment objects and things like that that people identified the layout of the house. It's a very traditional New Mexico house. Uh, the food that it shows up in the dinner scene, the religious iconography on the walls, which you guys saw briefly. Yeah, Carmen has a nice collection of her tablas hanging up. Um, the clothing, the folklore elements, which come in really heavy later in the game. Um, another interesting thing was one person identified the, so the social norms, which I didn't intentionally put in there, and it wasn't supposed to be a cultural element, but she said, yeah, the fact that Juan's the one that's like, I'm going to go solve this problem, and that it's the man General. taking the lead, mm -hmm. that it was, that she felt that that was very appropriate. So, something I didn't expect that came out of it. So, were participants able to identify cultural elements? Yes, they were. Um, how did they feel about the VR experience? Everybody really liked it. Um, the, I asked them what they thought about using VR in the language classroom, um, and they had some great ideas. The one that seemed to be the most popular is they said they wanted to do some kind of history game where they could go back and relive a historical event and talk to the characters and kind of interact with them. They thought that would be really fun. Um, also, one of the participants had a medical background. She thought it would be great for doing culturally sensitive patient interactions mm -hmm. or for practicing delivering sensitive information to patients. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they liked the ability to make mistakes. They liked having Juan as the helper character. Most of them did not need him, but a couple of them kind of stumbled onto it and thought that that was a very nice addition. Um, they liked the flexibility of practice, that this is in theory something they could do on their own time provided they have the equipment and just practice any time they want. I was actually really surprised by practice repeatedly because I thought this was going to be a limitation of the study because it's a mystery game. You know, once you solve the mystery, you don't want to, you know how it ends. It's not exactly fun anymore. But they said they wanted to go back and play it again. So I thought that was kind of an unexpected and interesting. And everybody really appreciated that it felt localized to New Mexico. They said that it felt nice to have something that was focused on the region. Negative feedback, motion sickness. Um, VR causes motion sickness, guys. And I programmed so hard trying to make it so that it wouldn't make you motion sick. And we started with 15 participants, and only 14 made it through um, because one person just could not keep going. Uh, the other negative feedback is two people said they would worry about doing something like this in class because you look inherently goofy doing VR. You know, you're flailing around, interacting with objects that aren't there. They said, I don't want to look silly in front of my classmates. Um, and the other feedback that was given is reality is always going to be more authentic, which, you know, we know. We embrace that. We understand that. This is just trying to something to try as an alternative. So, how did they feel about it? Great, except for the nausea. <laughs> um, participants in the state of flow, um, I asked them questions to try to determine if they entered a state of flow. They said that they felt that they needed to concentrate in the environment because of the very immersive nature and because it was a conversation, they felt like they needed to actively participate. Um, they thought that the characters and the story elements themselves also made it very engaging. Um, I had one person say that he felt like he was part of the little family in the story, which was kind of great. Um, related to that and level of detail, I had one participant say that she was distracted by the level of detail because she missed what Tia Carmen said because she noticed the coffee table had scratches on it and she was like, I could tell she's had this furniture forever. She was so busy staring at the coffee table, she completely missed all the dialogue about the treasure. Um, they liked the clarity of goals. The mystery game, you know, really provided tangible goals. They knew what they were doing, they knew what they were in there for. Um, a couple of them reported that they lost track of time. Um, Generally, the game takes anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour to play, depending on how much you want to interact with the characters. And a couple of them were really surprised how long they were actually in there and playing. Um, and most of them felt that it was a rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. So, did they enter a state of flow? Probably. We're going to go with probably. Strong yes. Um, so, in conclusion, it looks like in this very limited scenario that VR can have positive applications for heritage language learners. 
um, both for recognizing cultural elements and also language elements. So, thank you. Questions? Yes, so that's really cool. Um, my question is, would the data be different if it were heritage themes? You know, I, I think that it might. I think there might be some similarities, um, especially regarding flow, because a lot of it was that VR was a novel experience. I think that the differences might come more from whether they have prior experience with games mm -hmm. and virtual reality, um, which I really wish I'd asked questions about in right. retrospect. Mm -hmm. um, I would be really interested to see what second language learners did with this, um, but I think that I think that there might be some similarities, but especially on the cultural elements, depending on what level they're at, there might be some pretty striking differences there. Yeah. Can you do this for Russian? <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, actually. I'm Can not. we get funding is the next question. Well, that is the, always. But um, uh, so several things. I mean, this is very rich uh, presentation. So I mean, I won't have enough time. To <laughs> but so there is a, um, a VR game designed for Russian uh, at University of Maryland okay. uh, for L2 learners, not for hearing speakers. but advanced level, obviously, right. uh, and the, that game is um, similar, it's not a mystery game, but again, the goals are very tangible. Mm -hmm. uh, you are on a pirate ship, and the pirates that captured you are only Russian-speaking. They don't oh, understand okay. English, and they captured you, and you have to free yourself, and you have to go tell your friends, whatever. The students had so much fun with this one. Mm -hmm that they wanted more. So the, the tangibility, I don't know if it's a word in English, of the goal uh, at the end is extremely important because otherwise mm -hmm. we can interact for fun, but like, what's the point, right? Right. So my actually first question was, so how are they looking at the game? Are they looking, because I've, I've also been inside VRs. Mm -hmm. uh, are they looking on, on their phone with the glasses like that, that's why they're moving around and they get sick, or they're looking at a computer with, with 3D glasses? No, so they've, they've got the headset on and it's... You okay, know, so they're basically... It's a different kind of headset. Yeah, it's not usually, Not the one that I use, yeah, right, right, but it's, right, but it's similar and that's how it works, yeah. Yeah, right. and so they can also play it without the headset, um, because the one that got motion sick really wanted to just finish the game to find out how it ended, so we just unplugged the headset and you can look around using the mouse, and it's just on the But it's not going to be 3D. Oh, not a, no, it's not 3D. It yeah. looks like a pretty good computer game, though, so. Yeah. I you see. Know, halfway okay. there. Okay. Yeah, because, so so what I was, uh, so I, I, I played, uh, it wasn't a game, it was actually virtual reality simulation uh, by Tupac uh, Game It was pretty good. So what I noticed here, I don't know whether you have that option, is to make it more interactive. So I was able to open things with my eyes, like the, the eye games. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I saw that, that you have doors and stuff, but could students control the reality? Could they open things with their eyes, or they, it's more passive? You know, it's reception. Of, it started out being very active, and it became more passive just because I was the only one working on this, oh. and so. I had to start stripping things out because I was looking at, you know, I want to defend my dissertation at some point in the near no, future. You have your goal, too. So, right? so I was kind of like, okay, well, you know, sure, I'd love it if they could pick up the objects in the house and look at it, but that was one of the first things to go just because it does require additional programming and if, and if you are to control, right? Yeah, right, okay. yeah. So I, I wound up taking control away as much as I could and just having it be the language production. Um, because also the other thing was used, they used to be able to walk around the house and people wanted to go explore the house and so they'd wander off. I know. That's why, that's why I close all the doors in my house. I sit on the floor and I and I just rotate them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like so you don't mind the and, and actually somewhat related to that, the fade to black for the walking I wound up having to do because I had it where it was just moving them to sit down. And that made people so sick, including me, I couldn't even oh, test it. Wow, so wow. that's how we got the fade to black. But, uh -huh. So there were design choices behind a lot of this. Some of it was limitations. Some of it was just me not having enough time to program additional stuff. And some of it was when I was play testing, 
discovering that things I thought were a great idea were actually pretty terrible. That speech to text was pretty good. I mean, I was watching, uh, there was only one mishap. You said something, you said bueno, and then it, it, it's something else again. appeared yeah. Yeah, on the screen. So my question is, so all those captions uh, that appear, I mean, after you talk, mm -hmm. Can, after the end of the game, because, you know, as language teachers, we would like to analyze mm -hmm. post-factum what, you know, what was difficult, what not, the grammar. Uh, is there a way, after the game is done, for the students and the instructor to see this, this whole interaction written down and just go over it? Written down, yes. I've got it dumping everything to a text log. So or a transcript of yeah, the whole. Yeah, so it's a transcript of what gets sent to the AI and how the AI decides on the response. So it's a little, you know, kind of heavy on, on over information maybe, but you can still see what was said and what the responses were. And in all of the um, 14 or 15 people that you did, did they um, have moments when they definitely offered a lot more information and then it kind of went askew, you know? You know, there was a couple of those. Um, we actually didn't have very many, but we had a couple where people would really talk a lot yeah. to the characters and I had one person that desperately wanted to talk to Juan because she thought he was cute. Um, and <laughs> so when that happened, the AI just kind of you know, defaulted to, you know, okay, well, I'm not quite sure what to do with this, so I'm going to go with the next dialogue line. Um, the way I've got it set up is it's watching for keywords, and I have a pretty exhaustive keyword list, so mm -hmm. they could talk at length, and as long as it picks up on one of those words, then yeah, it's going to advance the story. Oh, interesting. So, oh, that was my next question, yeah. So yeah. you have to input a lot yeah. of, yes. of things in it so that IE understands AI, I mean, yeah. AI and <laughs> the avatar, understands what you know you're talking about or the mm -hmm. student's talking about because the student can blab for like five minutes, mm -hmm. right? And doesn't say a single keyword. Yeah. So that was a lot of that was playtesting it with just as many people as I could and we started off with just the text where they were just typing to the AI and and I was writing down all the ridiculous <laughs> things that people wanted to talk about, and then I did it again when I got the actual environment, because it turned out people wanted to talk about the Carmen's potted plants, and so I had the program lines in there for potted plants, Good. and you would not believe the amount of things I had to oh, add, so I yes. <laughs> it was a process. Wow. Yeah. Leslie, maybe you could mention, like, if, if people were really interested in, in collaborating and doing another game, what would it require of them? <laughs> of them. Um, a solid idea for what you want to do. So a solid plot. Um, someone to do the translation of the dialogue or to at least be able to sit with me and help me along with the dialogue because if I'm doing this in Russian, we're really going to need a hand. Of course. <laughs> I'm going to need a hand. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think that, and I really... I'm kind of hoping that if we do this again that we could get some kind of funding source somewhere because a lot of this was free assets and I wound up pitching in money for a lot of the assets mm -hmm. and you know like the New Mexico house I kind of cobbled together from a haunted house asset that I found for free mm -hmm. um, which you know it could look better obviously but you know houses are going to look different different places in the world so you know, things like that. The characters, I think I could probably model decent characters. Yeah, so we were, she was using a lot of free, re, a lot of free resources. So if we had funding, then that I have an idea about funding. How about that um, uh, teaching uh, grant, the, five, the 5K yeah. every, every December, the UNM one? I don't know whether 5K will be enough. I think it, but at help. least pay for some of the software you were It would definitely you know, help. And I, well, and I think the other thing is having a programmer to help with right. the future yeah. implementation would help because my knowledge of C-sharp is pretty much hit it with a stick until it works, and, and which got me pretty far, obviously, but, you know, I, I'd love to do something more polished. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but when Thea Carmen sits down, there's kind of a little animation hiccup where it's like she sits and then stands up and sits again. And that's just because I'm using a free asset to make animation easier because I'm not an animator. So, yeah. you know, I was kind of working with what I had. So if we had the money to get somebody to help out with that, it would probably make it a lot easier. 
So this is the forefront of, of actually language learning. And if people don't realize that this is the near future, then I feel sorry for them. Because, you know, if you right now start programming for, for language learning specifically, there are a few companies that are already doing that, but they charge a lot of money mm -hmm. for the product. And, and we are absolutely moving away. We're moving away from computers, you know, just flat, you know, computer to, to this, because this is much more interactive, as you said. You have the pragmatic knowledge, forms of address, you have the culture, everything. Mm -hmm. And the only, the only real issue right now is really to find people, programmers, who can dedicate their time, because mm -hmm. the, the, the real programmers don't think this is worth it. The language teachers think this is great, but like, how do you get them to talk, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. I, I is, don't know. Would that be a problem, Leslie, to find a programmer? I mean, finding one, no. You and them hiring processes, yes. Okay. But finding one, no. Yeah. And I just want to remind everyone that Leslie did almost all of this game yeah. by herself. <laughs> That's it her is <laughs> amazing. It's amazing the amount of skill and knowledge that went into this, that she had to learn a lot of it as she was doing it. No one, I don't know anyone else who could have done this, honestly. I'm so impressed. It was an experience. So, just write your dissertation. Yeah. That's the thing. Finish the dissertation as long as I do that. Yeah. What is the teacher's role? What is the teacher's role? I, you know, I didn't even get as far as going with what is the teacher's role. I just wanted to see, do they like this? Is but you know, that's something that you can develop the, later. Yeah, this is like a, like we do with you know talk abroad and trying to come up with best practices and stuff like that. So then, how do you prepare them? How do you how do you help them reflect on it and learn from it? Mm -hmm. There's in the game. There's nothing. There's no role. Yeah, and I, I really kind of see this more as an out-of-class activity, just because of the feedback I got about not wanting to look goofy in front of your classmates, and nobody wants somebody throwing up in a classroom from a trash can, so, you know, I'm kind of feeling like doing it outside of the class. <laughs> did, did people throw up? No, but I had somebody laying on the floor in my office for a little bit, which was a little touch and go. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about the speech-to-text aspect. So yeah. During this game, um, is everything transcribed then as they're speaking? Or? Yeah, yeah, and I, I took that out for a while. I had it originally set up that way so I could debug issues mm -hmm. as they came up. And when I started playtesting, people really wanted to be able to see what, yeah, what it took them down as saying because uh -huh. if it responded with something out of left field, they would say, well, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of helpful. Yeah. Um, but one thing with the speech to text, because it's still new, if you're doing anything with any kind of dialect, it can be hard because right now IBM has two types of Spanish, Mexican and Catalan, and that's it. <laughs> so if you speak anything else, good luck. Um, but it's, and they're still expanding and adding languages, so it's, and I did see an interest in Arabic. <laughs> so, um, but it's still very much a growing technology, and I think that was really kind of a big limitation because just frustration on the part of why isn't she understanding me, those poor people from southern New Mexico that, you know, were like, C, C, I said C, you know. So then the moment the kid avatar spoke, was that also on the screen or no? Yeah, yeah, that was, so the way it's set up is what they say is at the top and then what the avatar says is at the bottom. Could they do it in standard Arabic? I mean, would that be kind of weird? <laughs> That's a conversation for a whole time. I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. yeah. So where's the microphone that the, the, the catches the? It's wired into the headset, so they okay. don't have something hanging out in front of them. They just mm -hmm. and if they're doing it without the headset, then I just give them the Skype headset to her. I see. So it is quite sensitive. Yeah. I was thinking about. I mean, the pronunciation. Obviously, it's. You have to have a very sensitive mic that could catch all the different, um, um, uh, not hertz, what I'm trying to say, uh, frequencies mm -hmm. in order for, for those sounds to sound the way they're supposed to sound. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and in, in fast speech, that's very difficult, especially with the segmentation of words also, if you, if you keep that in mind. So it's a whole new area of, of taking into consideration 
because uh, you're not dealing with English, mm -hmm. you know, because English is more standardized that way. Yeah. Um, but and Spanish a, and a limitation that I found on that is when they get to the end of the game, when it's kind of the climax of everything, Tia Carmen, they're having a big confrontation with Amanda, and Tia Carmen says, why does she hate me so much? And well, you found all this, you know, if you've solved the mystery. And I had one poor participant start sneezing, and the microphone was picking up the sneezing, and they've got three chances to give Tia Carmen the right answer, oh. and she lost the game because uh. she was sneezing. <laughs> and she was so bad. Um, so, so I've got a save state for the end that can bring them right back to that part so that they can try it again just in case after that. But, so that's, you know, when you're talking about the microphone, that's another thing that you, know, you kind of have to... If you're going to have something like that, you really have to plan for it. Leslie, right. do you want to talk about the story at all? Like how you came up with that idea? I mean, the ideas and... Because the story is so northern New Mexico, really. The, the story is very northern New Mexico. It's um, heavily, like I said, heavily based on Rodolfo Maya and Bless Me Old Dumas. That's my favorite book. Yeah. And my signed copy, If My House Ever Catches Fire, it's I'm running back in for it. Um, so it's basically, um, Thea Carmen had a sister named Marianne when she was little, and Marianne and uh, Amanda's father, Roberto, um, his little brother, Tomas, Marianne and Tomas disappeared. And so um, the, as kids, they decided, oh, La Llorona took them. And it turns out, that, um, you know, we briefly mentioned that treasure element. Well, Roberto was worried about his father having enough money to keep his house. And so he told Tomas and Mariano, go, down, go play down by the river and, and I'll stay here at the house. And so he broke one of the adobe walls because sticking things in the walls of adobe houses is very New Mexico. And then he started feeling guilty about that and realized, oh God, my dad's gonna kill me. And so he went and played dead on the floor, and during this time, Marianne and Tomas disappeared, um, and Roberto said, oh yeah, the house got robbed. So I don't know what happened to them, and I, I, I don't know where that hole came from. I was passed out the whole time. Um, but in the meantime, also, Amanda has a real axe to grind with Tia Carmen because her father's always been really unhappy and said, oh, if only it wasn't for what happened with Carmen and, and her sister when I was little. So Amanda is, is kind of a bruja and is antagonizing Tia Carmen and trying to get her to move out of the house and stuff. So, and everything, uh, that, everything was intentional, like the name Juan. Juan is... Right, so Juan is... Uh, people named Juan are supposed to be... Luck, not lucky, but they're supposed to be able to bless people that have been cursed by witches. Hmm. And so at one point he tells Tia Carmen, oh, you should let me bless the house. And she says, no, don't do that, because she thinks that her sister's spirit is in the cat. And so she's afraid that you're going to accidentally drive her sister away. So, um, But then there's a bunch of other little nods to, to things like um, like putting, nails, putting little crosses made out of nails on the windows to keep the witches out. And Amanda, when she shows up making trouble, there's like a fireball, because fireballs and witches is a very northern New Mexico thing. And I'm really proud of that fire animation, by the way. It looks pretty cool. Um, I haven't seen it. Oh, really? I'll show it to you. Uh, what else? What else am I missing? Hi, oh, yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. I like it very much. And it opens a new vision for, for the language teaching, especially in, 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 in Chinese. <laughs> Right, and I, while you are doing the, 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 the speaking, I uh, uh, simply do some uh, very uh, quick Google. Yeah, we do have uh, some uh, sources uh, for, for Chinese teaching with the VR technology. And I, uh, I have a question for, 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 for yeah. this research. How do you uh, assess uh, the learners' language development while they are using the VR? You know, it, for this, it wasn't so much focused on the language development. Um, I was really focused more on the cultural aspects because language, and with heritage learners, because there's such a wide variety of backgrounds they could have as far as comfort and ability, um, I felt like the cultural was really something that would be more tangible that I could say, okay, did you identify these things in the environment? Because if I was doing language, then I think it would have just kind of been data overload for a small study. 
Um, I think that really, you know, I think if you were going to do something with language, you'd have to program very intentionally the things that you wanted to assess them on um, when you were writing the script and really have a list of these are the things I was looking out for for them to be able to accomplish when interacting. Um, but I think that would probably be the best bet for doing it. Or if you were going to introduce something new, you could always go pre-test, post-test, and you know, test them on the knowledge beforehand, have them run through the game and test them again afterwards. Anybody else? Yeah. So it seems that it's effective, but the barriers include uh, time and money. Mm -hmm. So it would be useful to have when we start going with students in the classroom, if only we had this excess of time and money. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, not an excess, but just any of either. I, well, yeah, not that much money. Not I mean, that, not, honestly, we, not that much money. Um, I think, and we have the equipment now. We have, well, we have the equipment now. The other thing is um, VR equipment is getting cheaper. And honestly, this might be able to run on the um, mobile device VR. I haven't tried it. I guess I probably should. <laughs> but, um, you know, and things like that are a lot more accessible to have available. Um, so I, I think that the money thing is going to be less of an issue. I think all told, I put this together for about $2,500 in the end. But that's only so, your time is free. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. The, time, the time is a thing. Yeah, the it's time. A huge amount of time. Yeah, the time is the thing. This was me working on this 18 hours every day for, for months. So. Yeah. But because you tried to do everything yourself. And she right. was also it's, learning everything. Right. Too. And so, I was also learning as I went. Yeah. And you're learning yeah. it as you go. But the, the way I listen, what, what I'm hearing here is if you have a group of people, one who just comes up with the, with the plot, with mm -hmm. the setting, you know, a creative writer, mm -hmm. then a second one who does the programming, then the third one who is the language teacher mm -hmm. who actually understands what, you know, what you're trying to assess there. So if you have a group of, a team of people to work on it, it would be much easier. And because each one of them specializes in something, in something different, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? If you try to do everything yourself, yeah. first of all, it's a lot of time, and then, yeah. you know. So it's army knives and only good for so many things. So but I think, you know, trying to come up with a theme and stuff, I don't think that's an individual. I think you need to have multiple people involved in that. Because you bounce ideas off each other, it makes it better. Yeah, if you're in Hollywood, you can have a whole team of people writing no, on the story. No, it's just like even me and Leslie sitting there, because that's the only thing that I really helped her with. Well, that and, and even just our lab attendants, you know, the ones that had grown up in New Mexico, I'd go out and ask them and say, hey, what do you guys think of this? And they'd say, that's terrible, don't do that, or, mm -hmm. you know. That's a good idea. Informants, so, right. That's what you mean. Native informants from this area. Okay. Yes, you definitely. Because even I cannot do if it's set in Siberia, what do I know about Siberia, right? I mean, even I never know about Siberia. I do. <laughs> I have some relatives who know about Siberia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a great thing. And if you could <clears throat> do something like this in the fall, like Grab, uh, gather a group of people, even students, you know, mm -hmm. give them extra credit for whatever, you know, and ask them to come up with a plot, and then other is gonna do, others are going to do research on cultural mm -hmm. uh, stuff, you know? It really, like it really that. could be kind of a classroom thing. It would also be a really great interdisciplinary thing, and maybe get some of the people from, uh, well, not just computer science, but what What's the film in game program um, out by the airport? The new FDM. I IFDM. FDM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. IFDM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would probably be something really good to rope them in on too. Because yeah. I think I think that's the key. I think having a team that's actually yes. knowledgeable and not learning from YouTube videos and speak of is probably good. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you.